So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout the Judah and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Yes. Well, good morning. good morning. What a delightful experience to be here at the Northeast Church on such a wonderful Sabbath. Amen. Wow. Wow. <laughs> this is uh, awesome. We are so grateful and blessed. Amen. You know, Kathy and I had the privilege of being here on the very first Sabbath that your pastor, Eliab, was here. Came to be here as your pastor. It's the last time we were here, unfortunately, and that's almost two years in August. Oh, excuse me, three years. It'll be three years in August. As we sat there that day in the midst of his brand new sermon and a brand new out of college graduate theology major called to minister in the name of Jesus Christ, all of our phones went off. Do you remember that? It was advising us of what was happening over at the mall at Walmart. But this young preacher just went right on through, didn't miss a beat. Amen. I want to tell you, I love your pastor. Amen. He's a special man. And uh, when you see him in the baptistry interacting with individuals, you know that's how he is with people. Because he loves the Lord and the Lord's love is in him and comes through him to you. So what a blessing, what a great thing it is to be able to be here on such a wonderfully special high Sabbath day. I want to take just a moment to talk to you for, about El Paso Adventist Junior Academy. It was a wonderful announcement a few moments ago. I don't know if you noticed some of the detailed lines on those posters, but it used to be one through eight, then it became kindergarten through eight, and then it was kindergarten through nine, and then kindergarten through 10. I want to tell you that just within the last month, the North American Division Office of Education, in concert with the Southwestern Union Office of Education, as a request from the, from the Texaco Conference K-12 Board of Education, has voted to allow to officially approve El Paso Adventist Junior Academy to become, to move in the direction of, a full 12th grade school in El Paso. Amen. That is something to be grateful for and excited about. Now, I don't know that there's going to be any 12th graders next year, but there are already some 11th graders in line. And uh, wouldn't you know it, the Lord has brought another teacher. And when you have grades 9 through 12, if you just have up to 10, you can act as an extension of an elementary school as far as accreditation and certifications of the teaching staff. But when you have 9 through 12, you have to have teachers that are certified in every one of the subject areas that they are teaching. Kind of a novel idea. Good, a good one, perhaps. Well, the Lord brought uh, the fourth teacher this year, and now all of the subject areas are covered with certified teachers for El Paso Adventist Junior Academy. I want you to hear from my heart that I believe this is one of the most important things that you can do is to support and love on and encourage everybody who has kids that age to be sure to do everything within your power to help them have that option because I'm going to tell you what's going on in the government schools nowadays is not only scary, a lot of it is evil. I am scared for some of our kids. Concerned, And so I pray that this school, I know it's a few miles away, but it's, a, it's so much closer than, uh, than well, it, it's worth every, every turn of the week. So uh, just know that we are heavily engaged, 
committed in and committed to this school and to all of the constituent churches and all of the potential members and the actual students. May God bless El Paso Adventist Junior Academy as this school year is in planning stages right now. Well, Pastor Eliab uh, talked to me several weeks ago about uh, coming here and perhaps even having a weekend series on finances, church finance, individual personal finance, because the leaders of the church have planned to have uh, a special series of financial seminars that will help in many, many ways as you all plan to become more responsible with your resources, understanding the power of the Lord to provide for all your needs, even in the midst of a giving attitude. I love the, the appeal for the offering today. What a wonderful thing. God's wallet doesn't need our money. Amen. Only a little God would depend on us. Amen. Our wallets need God's money. What a blessing he's promised to pour into this uh, family and to all of, all of us who take him at his word. However, having said that, Pastor Eliab said, well, we're not going to do that series right now. We're going to do the ark, and there's going to be a big trip, and there's going to be a break of some things happen, and we're going to do it later. So preach on anything you want to. Wow. That's a fun assignment. This morning, I want to talk about something that's really, really very important in my own heart, and I hope to yours as well. We have seen a demonstration, evidence, illustrated right before our eyes today of exactly what this message is, an, is all about. As we begin to uh, consider the words of Scripture and, this, and the uh, message that we have to share today, I'd like to ask if you'd bow your heads with me. Father dear, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his gift of life to each of us. Not life just now, but the promise of life eternal. Thank you for the salvation that is ours through his sacrifice for us. And thank you for the privilege that he gives to us to engage with him in the mission of sharing the good news with others. Thank you for Fabian, and I pray your special blessing on him. Just live in him in a powerful way, I pray. And then bless each of us as we open your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I was born into a home where both my parents were Seventh-day Adventists. They were active in our local church. It was a little church. In fact, it was a farming community in extreme southeastern North Carolina, a little place called the Green Swamp. It wasn't because of the color, it had an E at the end of green, it was because of the name of a general in the, uh, in the Civil War that marched his troops through there. And uh, they named it after him. But it was my home for the first uh, seven or eight years of my life. I lived there with a lot of other wonderful folks in community around us. Our little church had two rooms. On the right, when you went in, was the school room. A school room. I was the only first grader. And on the left was the sanctuary. That building was the center of our lives and the community of faith that was right there in the green swamp. Well, we tried to dress it up a little bit. We called it Winter Haven. Uh, the community just thought it sounded better than the green swamp. But anyway, we were all about the church. My family, my mom and dad, totally invested in, engaged in everything that had to do with the church. Every time the doors were open, we were there. In fact, most times we opened them and most times we closed them. My dad was the first elder and, lawn and landscaper. My mom was the treasurer and the Dorcas leader and the cleaner of the church, the janitor. So we had lots to do at the church, both on Sabbaths as well as all through the week. But it was a wonderful thing to understand what it was like to be all in for what was very, very important to our family, our church family as well. But we were not a large group. We were active and involved in ministries and programs. And from my earliest memories, 
I can, re-talk, I can recall talk about how important it was to have a serious commitment to the mission of the church. After all, we were the descendants of those first followers of Jesus who accepted his teachings and believed that he was indeed the Messiah, the Son of God. The marching orders that Jesus left those dear early believers, those whom we call disciples, was to be his witnesses to everyone everywhere. You heard the reading, first in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Wow, that's a big deal. That's a big mission for these small, this small group. The, <clears throat> they were to be charged to make disciples, thereby enlarging the army of witnesses. Make disciples. They were disciples, but they were to make disciples. And the concept of church growth is really at the heart of this idea of what it means to be called to discipleship. Now, disciples are some very interesting people. They're, they're very different from the regular folks, you know. I'd like to just call regular folks members. You saw what happened this morning. We have a new member in this El Paso Northeast Church. We also have a new member that I believe has been called to be a disciple. We're gonna talk about that differentiation in just a moment. As a denomination, we've long been focused on membership. We talk about the statistics of those who have been baptized in a given year and we compare it with what it was the last year and we add the totals together to see where the total membership is. That is now in excess of 22 million around the world. And tomorrow, the organizational meeting called the General Conference in Session will convene for the next five days through the sixth, five or six days. Um, It's actually Monday, I guess it starts, but it's gonna be in St. Louis where folks from around the world field are gathered to conduct the business of the church, elect officers and approve reports and plans. But we look at those church growth numbers and they have a little bit of a sad part as well. While we're considering the growth in membership, it's important to understand that there have been way too many folks who have been baptized. And Fabian, this is not you, brother, who choose to walk outside of the relationship with the church for one reason or another. And I want to just tell you that unfortunately, in the church, in the period from 2011 to 2020, in North America alone, there were more than 120,000 people who were part of those baptized who have walked away for one reason or another. And when we add all of the other 12 divisions of the world field, that number's way over a million. Those are precious people that were part of our family. And they, for some reason, decided not to belong any longer. Why is that? What's the problem? Don't we know what we're doing? Do we have the truth? Do we follow Jesus? What's up? Of course, there are many reasons for this reality. However, for a few minutes this morning, I'd like to consider something that I believe is at the root of this challenge. I also believe that the importance of this factor is further made clear when we compare the membership model with the mission model that Jesus gave to his faithful followers just before he ascended into heaven. That was the commission to carry on his work, his work. While we have historically tracked church growth in terms of members, I believe that the core factor in this whole measurement is really impacted by those members who have accepted the call of Jesus to become disciples. A disciple is way different than a member. So what's the difference? They're both baptized in the same waters. They're both accepted into the membership roles of the church. And in some cases, they both attend the same church for years. However, people who choose to maintain their status as members tend to come for a while, maybe even become somewhat active in the church. But after some time, someone hurts them, says something unkind about them or to them, and they get offended. 
When that happens, the likelihood of them walking away from active church fellowship is very great. Puts an incredible burden on all of us who are their fellows, who are their family. Unfortunately, there are other members in the church who have not embraced the call to become disciples, who are willing to make demands for performance or behavior or sermonize on all the changes the new person must make before they can truly belong to our church. Members who do that to, to new folks are people who have, may have become Adventists, but are not yet truly Christians. That may be a strong statement, but I believe it with all my heart. When we are Christians and we call ourselves by his name, we have an obligation to allow his spirit and his character to become, to in, impact ours, to transform us from the persons that we used to be who are willing to say things like that or to do unkind things who are willing to exact behavior in order for someone to be part of the family. That's not the, that's not the scriptural commission that Jesus left with his first believing group as he left to go back to heaven. I would like for us to consider that when a person understands that by accepting Jesus, as our Lord and Savior, and they follow his example of being baptized. And by the way, baptism in the scriptures only refers to baptism by immersion. That word by definition, if you go to the Greek, does not suggest any other type of baptism. And Fabian has been in those pool, in that pool, in those waters this morning. They've basically when they rise, Pastor Eliab says, to walk in a newness of life, the new life, a life filled with a sense of mission, a life that is marked by their own conversion and a mission to tell others about Jesus and the gift of eternal life that he offers to all. Someone may feel that their story is not important. Lord, give me a testimony. Those people that pray that really don't want a testimony. They don't want the test that precedes the testimony. They just want a story, and they want to be able to feel like they got something to share. But their story is important. Even though they feel that no one would be interested in knowing about the power of the love of God that's transformed them from who they used to be to who they are now. I love the comment that Mary Magdalene shares in a current video ministry presentation some of you may have seen on the life of Jesus. When someone asked Mary what happened to her, why does she seem so different from before? She responds, I was one way and now I am completely different. And the thing that happened between was him. Every one of us have that kind of story. Your story is important to somebody's understanding and somebody's belief that, that Jesus, what Jesus did for the, for the person telling the story is also available to them. That's what conversion transformation is all about. Like the words of that old song, I don't know if you've ever sung it, things are different now, something happened to me since I gave my life to Jesus. Things I loved before are gone away, things I love much more have come to stay difference. There is a transition at some point, and many of us, most of us perhaps would not even know when that is, but when we were not converted to when we are now converted. Something has happened in each of our lives to bring us to an understanding, an opportunity to choose to walk with the Lord. A disciple we already talked about who a member is. They might just kind of get disappointed and leave, or hurt and leave. But a disciple, on the other hand, understands that every person who has accepted Jesus as his or her personal savior is a missionary, and every person who has not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior is a mission field. Got that? Every person with Jesus is a missionary. Every person without Jesus is a mission field. It's that simple. A disciple also understands that everyone that they come into contact with is someone for whom they may be called to engage for Christ. 
His great commission is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Make disciples was his charge. Now we may wonder, how do we do that? We can't make anybody become anything. But by us sharing our story with someone else, by them believing that that is absolute truth, that Jesus is real and that he can change, transform, save, redirect, recreate, make all things new. In case there's still a question about who is really a disciple, let me share the definitions that I found on my cell phone. I couldn't believe this. It's not, it's not even a Christian dictionary, but I went to the dictionary that's an app on the phone. And I just put in the word disciple. Came up with two definitions. The first one has three parts. Listen to what the dictionary said. A disciple is one of the 12 personal followers of Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? The second definition, uh, the second part of definition one, one of the 70 followers sent out by Jesus in Luke 10, one, that's in my dictionary. And the third part of definition one, any other professed follower of Jesus in his lifetime, specifically during his earthly ministry. Now, there are some people that like to carve out a, a timeline for Jesus' lifetime, but you know we're, we're gonna not take time with that because I don't think any of us have a question, but I think that's where definition two comes in any professed follower of Jesus Christ. All about Jesus. That definition includes you and me nearly 2,000 years later and right here in El Paso. We are followers of Jesus and by definition, we have been called to be disciples. Isn't it interesting that while there are other teachers, there were rabbis all around, the Jews as well as other folks that were just sort of on the outside, they had followers too. They called all the followers disciples. It was the, someone who believed and practiced the teachings of someone whom they followed. That's the word disciple. So I hope we can agree that being a disciple of Jesus is a pretty special and very important calling. The importance of being a disciple applies to the official 12 who walked and lived with Jesus during his earthly ministry and also to all who respond to his call to discipleship down through the ages. It's for real. Still happening today. Now that we understand who they are, what do disciples do? Jesus had some very specific counsel on that, and I would like to have us explore his teaching and his instruction. So he laid it out, the first mission to those first disciples. You know, it's interesting to me, and I've come to really, really appreciate the second book of Luke. You all read that one too, right? There's the Gospel of Luke, and then the second book of Luke, Acts. Wow. In the Gospel of Luke, we read about all that Jesus did in his ministry. And in Acts, we see what the impact that has had on those who were part of it and who are continuing it as a result in response to his call to do so. Let's uh, turn to his first book, the Gospel of Luke. In the 24th chapter, we see something kind of interesting. Oftentimes, when we think of the Great Commission, you know, go ye therefore into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples. We call that the Great Commission. But did you know, while that's in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Luke also records his version of the Great Commission. He's writing what Jesus had to say right near the end of the last chapter of the book of Luke. Looking at verse 44. He, Jesus, now this is happening, if you'll just look back quickly to the verses right ahead of it. It's happening because the two men that went from Jerusalem to Emmaus, who were so dejected after Jesus was crucified, and they were just really struggling, and they just were ah, beside themselves with grief. 
And Jesus came and walked along with them. The resurrected Jesus came and walked along with them and told them things that they just couldn't believe. Uh, but yet, these guys, as soon as Jesus, is, uh, as they recognize him, he disappears. And they come running back to Jerusalem. And they go to where they know the disciples are, and they're talking about what happened. And then just the next verse in 36, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Well, basically, he's just confirming to them that indeed he has risen from the dead. Interesting that he asked for something to eat so he could show that he has a phys he's a physical being. He's not just some uh, spirit that's standing before them. And so he says to them, I just want you to know that all I told you must be fulfilled it's written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophet, and the Psalms. Those were the three sections of the scripture that was available to the folks at that time. Believe it or not, they didn't have the New Testament yet. We've got something that those guys didn't have. And then verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me. Then he opened their minds. I've often wondered, how in the world does he do that? We pray, we sing the song, open our eyes, Lord. We pray that God would open our hearts, our ears, that we would hear his voice, that our hearts would know him, become more like him. But it says here in verse 45 that he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Verse 47, the, great, the Gospel Commission in Luke. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Hmm. We go back in these in the chapters that precede, you're going to find other illustrations and, and places where Jesus had talked about what is going to be coming. When he leaves them, he's going to send the Spirit. And then it says, uh, forgiveness and repentance is what you're going to preach. That, by the way, is the very center of the scripturally mandated message that Jesus' followers were supposed to be telling others about him. Repent. Turn away from sin, let your life be now aligned with Jesus, and he will forgive your sins. What an amazing call to followers. Didn't say anything about talking to them about even tithe or, or uh, church attendance or dress codes or all, you know, all those kinds of things. He just told them to preach repentance and forgiveness of sin. That's the charge to the disciples. But now Luke continues with this story over in his second book, Acts 1, and we already heard through the reading of the scripture reading, uh, the first seven verses of that. Basically, he's once again saying, I want you to stay in Jerusalem, don't go anywhere, just wait until something very special happens. He says, you've been baptized as did John baptize you with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Wow, what does that even mean? Baptized by the Holy Spirit. Washed over our souls. Filling our hearts. Refocusing our minds cleansing us from the sinful nature and, and attitudes and actions of past times. Baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, were they still going to be humans? Yep. Sure enough, Jesus was 100% divine and 100% human, but not so with us disciples. We only have access to goodness or anything uh, in terms of perfection by his righteousness laid upon us, not by anything that we do. 
or however hard we try to figure out what the list should include. The very fact that someone thinks they can make a list makes me want to say every time, I don't even want to see your list. Because all of it is the definition of filthy rags. Your righteousness is not where it's at. So, here we have Jesus once again still, you know, at the end of Luke, it says that he ascended into heaven. But here, just in the first few verses of chapter 1 of Acts, Jesus is still with them. And don't you love the part where he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. My friends, that power is at the very heart and it is the basis for which there is any possibility for anything good to come from the mission or any success at all. It is his power. Someone once, I heard a pastor not too long ago say, I'm an old fashioned preacher. You know, I, I believe in what the Bible says. Not by might nor by powerpoints, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So it's right out of the Bible here. And this is exactly what he says. The power is what is, what is from him. He's the only one that can make that happen. He, his father had promised it, and he said that he was going to send it to them as well. Well, we just continue on. We can just uh, see uh, another verse or two in chapter 1 I draw your attention to. Now, first of all, we've been thinking all along about 12 disciples, but we know that before the crucifixion, something seriously bad happened to one of those. Judas was no longer a part of the 12, and so Peter stands up uh, and says they need to do something to find a replacement for Peter. But you see what's happening? At the, in verse 13, with the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill on the Mount of Olives, about a Sabbath day's walk from the city. Well, that's a pharisaical thing for you. They told them they could walk about 2,000 cubits. Now, everybody knows what a cubit is, right? Is that in metric or standard measurement? Well, it's about 3,000 because a cubit is measured as the distance between the elbow of a man's arm and the tip of the longest finger. So somewhere between 15 and 16 and 18 inches. Assuming 18 inches, it would be 18 inches or 1.5 feet times 2,000 cubits is 3,000 feet. 3,000, is a little over a half a mile. So that's how far they were, they were told as Jews that they could walk on a Sabbath. And that became the distance that they measured. Well, it was basically from... Mount of Olives to where they were, house where they were staying. And it lists those who were present, all 11 of them now. But then verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Prayer. That was their first resort. That's exactly the place where they started in their waiting they prayed. They sought the Lord's gift of his wisdom and understanding and un of the mission that they've been called to, uh, to engage in. And so it was that prayer became the foundation of their community. We'll see this repeated through the book of Acts in very interesting ways. By the way, there were women and the mother of Jesus. They were all considered disciples in the larger sense as followers of Jesus. Now, how many were there? The very next verse tells us. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. Okay? So the, tw the official 12, now 11, but made whole with the addition of Matthias, were 10% of the disciples that were part of those who received that commission from Jesus. They were praying. And then we get to the very beginning of chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like, by the way, they were still all together. Isn't it amazing? They were still doing what Jesus asked them to do. Stay together. Wait. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting 
They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This is a powerful demonstration of divinity, divine power. The power had become real and it was deployed right as God, as Jesus and the Father had promised. So it was that these folks responded through the Spirit in a way that really surprised a lot of people. Now, there's a lot of misunderstanding about this other times. I want to take just a moment to talk about that for a second. It is not to be understood that these folks were babbling on in unintelligible sounds. Some people say they go to a church and folks get slain in the spirit. They're jumping pews and rolling in the aisles and just carrying on and just screaming a bunch of nonsense. What happened when these people spoke in tongues? It is unbelievable. We don't have time today to unpack this section, but it just to understand that there were two specific dispersions of Jews. It's called in general the diaspora. Basically, at about four or five hundred BC, so a long time, generations ago, if we were looking at it from AD 33-34. They were driven by the Babylonians and the Assyrians out of their territory to just try to escape. I have a, a map here in my Bible that talks about all of the places where Jews had gone as a part of this dispersion. And it's several thousand miles. Here's Jerusalem and here's Rome. Here's Jerusalem, and Parthia is beyond the page here. You look down through the list of places where the people had gone. But interestingly enough, verse 5 says, Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. They had come back. Several reasons are given, but uh, this time it was Pentecost. This was just 50 days after the first day of Passover. Okay? Penta means 50th. And basically they had come back. It's one of the pilgrimage festivals. And you can see that these folks, having lived for 500 years plus, there were babies born, people grew up and had children, they always were able to speak the Aramaic language. They kept the heart uh, focused on the gospel of the, uh, or the Roman, excuse me, the Jewish, the Jewish laws and the story of their, their uh, origin through creation and who God was in their lives. But they also spoke the languages of the people where they had gone. They grew up speaking, they were bilingual. Good grief, I can't even do it well in one language. But these folks were speaking at least two. And what happens is you just list down the whole group of people that were there. Both Jews and converts. They're visitors from Rome and Libya near Cyrene. Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. They were hearing and everybody talking at the same time but speaking directly to people in languages as a wonder of what Jesus had done for them and to draw their attention to the mission of these disciples and to God himself. Interesting. That's the purpose of the way the gift of that Spirit of God impacted the lives of these disciples. They were to bring glory to God. Well, this is a, a magnificent session as we walk through the experience of the early disciples, but time doesn't allow us to go any further. Let me just simply say that in Peter got offended. He was a member and a disciple. Because some people made fun of them saying they've just had too much wine. Celebrating the festivals. Peter stood up raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Read his speech, his sermon, if you will. 
it goes right back to the prophets and starts with Joel. And he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all my people. This is what just happened here. The spirit of God has been poured out on this group of people, this 120 group of disciples that had been left there to follow on with Jesus, uh, with his ministry. And uh, just continuing on, it goes through the whole story about David. They thought David was a wonderful patriarch, perhaps could even be their eternal king. But he says, I can take you, you know, good and well. He went to the grave and he's still there. But Jesus has been resurrected. He is the Messiah. He was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised him to life, and we are all witnesses of that. And then he continues, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? His response is classic. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized. That's exactly what Jesus told him to say. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What an amazing promise. Oh, my friends, this story is just so profoundly exciting to me that I, I just, uh, I love it. And uh, I have become reacquainted in recent times with this magnificent book of Acts. And I have come to understand how incredibly consistent the call is to the disciples 2,000 years ago and to disciples in 2022. Amen. We have been called as well. There's pages here that are flipping because of uh, time, but just wanted to close to ask rhetorically what does this mean to us we weren't there then we didn't hear Peter preach we didn't see the tongues of flame there's an interesting thing if you had time to study it between just the use of the word tongues of fire because this is a supernatural thing and Luke is using every imaginable way of con considering it in languages that were available to him to describe what he saw but it looked like they were lapping tongues of fire, but also the word that is used for tongues really relates not only to the human tongue, but to language. And the same thing happened with wind. It's amazing how this whole thing has come together in such a supernatural way. As we page through this chapter, this book, the book of Acts, we will find that Peter and John were full of the Holy Spirit. They laid their hands on the people that Philip had baptized in Samaria, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. You'll see that Stephen, when he was one of the seven that was selected to wait on tables to take care of the needs of the people in the community, that the, the, the apostles said, choose someone who's known to be full of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever seen anybody that had a Holy Spirit uh, gauge on them? How can you tell when somebody's full of the Holy Spirit? But they chose people, and Stephen demonstrated the gift of that spirit as he meekly knelt and prayed, looking at a vision of his own to the right hand of the, of the Father. He saw the resurrected Jesus as the stones were pelting upon him, and he died. Saul, same thing. Just read through the book of Acts. You will see that the Holy Spirit is at the heart of of all that they are involved in. And that, my friends, I believe, is the secret that many of us miss when it comes to work of discipleship and reaching out and telling other people about Jesus. You see, there's a lot of folks who've been members for a long time, and they just kind of get excited every once in a while. There's another seminar, another book on New Testament witnessing or how we tell others about Jesus and need to go through another seminar. My friends, some of us have been getting ready to get ready to get ready to get ready for 40 years. I want to tell you it's time to get in the game. 
Jesus is coming soon and there are people that need to hear the good news about what he's done for each of us and them as well. So does the Holy Spirit still empower believers today? Absolutely. I have absolutely no doubt. As I considered this question in my own mind, I went back in my memory to the beginning of my junior year in a Seventh-day Adventist Christian school, Mount Pisgah Academy in the western mountains of North Carolina. As the school year was just getting underway, the faculty and administration had prepared a special spiritual weekend. In a boarding academy, it's 24-7, and so they didn't just have a lesson plans from uh, 7.30 to 5.30 on five days a week. They had to be worried about the whole week, every day. They had prepared a special spiritual focus to share with us uh, over the days of that first weekend. Powerful, powerful, relevant, and it a weekend. It was impacting, impactful, and just absolutely rocked the majority of the student body in a profound way. As I think back on it, it was just unbelievable. It was beyond description. The Friday night meeting, the first Friday night of the school year, ended with us singing some wonderful songs together, songs with words that seemed to drill deep into our hearts and call for surrender and, with, and to relationship. And as the service ended and we were dismissed to our respective dorms, you know, that's a, back in those days, there were pink and blue sidewalks. You know, the guys exited one side and the girls the other and walked to their dorms, but the guys didn't walk on the girls' sidewalks. Um, it, was, it was important to maintain decorum, they called it. However, the group of students didn't just stay on those sidewalks. They walked rather instead down the main entrance road to the academy and ended up in the large parking lot in front of the gymnasium in a massive circle, more than 150 students holding hands, singing as they had, as we had all the way from the church to that point. Some of those same songs that had been so moving earlier in the service. And as we did, you can imagine that the group of students was joined by a group of faculty. You know, these are the folks that go home and leave the students to the dean's responsibility. Their day, their week was over, but not quite, because this group of students was still worshiping. Several students shared an experience or two that they had had and felt compelled to praise God for working through the experience to bring them to this school for this school year. Just seeing the steps that had gotten taken care of, finances, challenges with distance, relationships with parents and issues at home, all of that had worked out to bring this group of students together for this year. Praise was the word. Everybody was excited and greatly um, thankful for what was going on. And then we went to prayer, and as soon as the prayer time ended, it's one of those sentence prayers, if you can imagine, around a large group praying loudly in the evening calm. A sentence here, a sentence there, and finally it was over and the songs began again. What a night. I want to just tell you that I will never forget that night. No one wanted to interrupt what the Spirit was doing in that brand new young school year with this group of students. It was beyond anything that had been planned. Now, we learned later that the faculty had spent a lot of time in the couple of weeks before school praying about this school year and asking for God's special blessing and His Spirit to be poured out among the, and upon the students. even though some of the students who had chosen to go back to the dorms early on realized that there wasn't, that the rest weren't coming. They even joined us, and it was amazing. The way each student was valued and encouraged by the others almost completely overwhelmed the usual ways that teenagers treated each other. We later uh, thought back on this and saw how this school year, I had been at that school before. This was different. 
students gave their hearts to the Lord. There were baptisms, students. There were students who called family members and friends and talked to them. And they came and were baptized at the Academy Church that year. The activities to reach out into the community to share the witness of what God was doing in our lives and in our school became more numerous and broad. Well, obvious that it was God that had shown up in a profound way through the ministry of his spirit. I've thought about that school year many times and I have to say that it is, it's the point in my own life where I feel like that my faith went deeper. I made a grown up decision as a junior in high school that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life and that I was gonna walk with him for all the days that he gave me. As I consider the way the Spirit works, I'm convinced that the same phenomena that we experience can happen again. It can happen right here at El Paso Northeast Church. It can happen at El Paso Adventist Junior Academy. This year, like never before, when the Spirit is poured out upon the people, there's nothing that He can't do through them and us for His glory. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe that? Yes. The church grows through the power of the Holy Spirit, but until we're willing to be together in one accord, united, focused, open, committed, we may hold off that powerful blessing if we choose not to engage. I want to ask you to pray about it and then pray about it some more understanding that prayer is where it starts the spirit is where is what directs the spirit is what gives power and the spirit is what uses disciples to bring others to Jesus who is the spirit cultivating an interest for the impact of a faithful disciple to extend the invitation of Jesus to this year who in your world who that you may come in contact with next week next month three months from now to share the powerful words of Jesus when he says, follow me into a life of discipleship. My friends, my brothers and sisters, my prayer is that more than ever before, we will be so drawn to the invitation of Jesus that we will just not be able to set it aside. We will be empowered through the pouring out of his spirit in ways that will just take our hearts by surprise, but not really because we've made ourselves available and we've chosen to walk with him. May that be the story of this church, of this set of churches in the El Paso area, of our school, all of it, all for the glory of God. May God bless us each one. To this end is my prayer.